This week on Quality Digest Live, we're here at Quality Expo in Chicago to talk about the future of quality and the future of manufacturing. We'll also be joined by Forrest Breifogel, president of Smarter Solutions and one of the speakers of this year's Quality Expo. All that and more when we come back. Welcome back to Quality Digest Live for September 23rd, 2011. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Mike Richmond, publisher of Quality Digest. Well, as I said, we're here at Quality Expo in Chicago, and I'm joined by my guest co-host this week, Jeff Dewar, who is the CEO of Millennium 360, Quality Digest parent company. So, Jeff, you are returning to the show, your, your second time on QDL. Yes, I've been looking for another chance to get on the show. <laughs> Since your uh, very successful interview with Talian Edwards from CMSC. Yeah, in uh, Phoenix. In Phoenix, about yeah. two months ago. Well, as a, at CMSC here at Quality Expo, we're talking about technology and, and the future of quality. But what have you seen? I've seen a lot of optimism. Before, when we were getting ready for this show, uh, you know, with all the gloomy news in the economic world, double dip session possibilities, uh, you know, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know if we'd have people here. I didn't know what the, the mood would be. And what I see is optimism, and I see a lot of enthusiasm about individual businesses that we're talking to about what their prospects are. And I've heard a lot of good news from people that have said our businesses are doing great. Yes, business is up. It's like, it's like they're ignoring the recession. Well, I, I, I think that, that you know, we tend to get scared off many times by the big picture items. And we, you have to realize that, that people who are, yeah. who are sharp and are doing good work will always find customers and are always going to find business. And that's what we're finding, I think, here at, at this year's QE. It's, it's really been a good experience for us. Absolutely. And, and again, for many of the, of the customers and the partners that we work with, uh, for instance, Creaform. We had a, a really good uh, shoot yeah. uh, of Technorazi yeah. Live at Creaform earlier today. Yep, our live video broadcasting arm. Mm -hmm. uh, Technorazi Live, as many of you have seen. Uh, Creaform introduced their Mac Shot with 3D, which is a photogrammetry product. Very interesting new product. And, and that episode of, of Technorazi Live, if you happen to miss it, will be on our website within the next week or so. So please keep a lookout it for was that. Great work with them because they are very open to some creative ideas. You can do a lot with video production and broadcasting if you have a group of people that are willing to stretch the boundaries a little bit. Right, absolutely. And they really were. And they and that's just one example of, yeah. of what we're seeing here. I mean, there's a lot again of, of great technologies and, and great great products, great software, great hardware, great service solutions, you know, great ideas. And and again, if if you're not coming to a show like Quality Quality Expo, Certainly consider coming to Quality Expo next year. In 2012, it'll be in Fort Worth, uh, is the regional show, and they're back here in 2013 uh, here in McCormick. So consider it and, and kind of circle it or leave it in, in your mind for the future. It's a really great show and a lot, of, a lot of good stuff going on here. Yeah, and certainly McCormick Place in Chicago has made just a, a, a tremendous transformation of the customer service arena. I mean, they were, uh, you know, potentially looking down the face of losing a lot of businesses yeah. as conferences and conventions were looking about going elsewhere. And they grasped that challenge very thoroughly and have really changed things in terms of how things operate here mm -hmm. and, and quite frankly, just their general attitude with yeah. how they approach the exhibit. I think so, I think so. You know what I like about this show? Again, we talked about ideas, that, that it, it's a show of creative ideas, people doing creative things and finding ways to succeed in business. And, and one way they really do that many times is through, is through tools, obviously, through, through, through implementation of, 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 uh, of good tools and, and creative tools and ways to integrate different elements of their, of their enterprise uh, into a unified whole which is a great segue for our, our guest that we have on, on this week's uh, episode of Quality Digest Live, Forrest Breifogel. And Forrest is the uh, CEO and president of Smarter Solutions in Texas. And Forrest is also one of the speakers at this year's Quality Expo. So Forrest, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Michael. Jeff? Welcome, Forrest. Now tell us a little bit about Smarter Solutions. Well, Smarter Solutions, uh started one in 1992, so somewhat of an old company after I had a 24-year gig with IBM, mm -hmm. and where the last 12 years I was an internal statistical consultant. And I thought there really needed to be a method of putting everything together. And so that's what my really big thing is. And I've kind of grown up a lot since 1992, mm -hmm. and now I'm moving it to more of a business system, and not just doing projects. Because I think sometimes we work on process improvement projects where we're answering the wrong question to the third decimal place. Yep. 
Now, as part of my preparation for this, um, I looked uh, at some of your background and some of the philosophies that you hold and some of the, the services that you provide. And could you give us sort of a brief evolution of how you see the quality movement and how it's moved, say, over the last 30 years? Well, I think we've we've had a lot of things that's happened. We've had quality circles. You know, we're doing Six Sigma. We had TQM. We're doing Lean, and we're working on a lot of process improvement efforts. But you know, who gets uh, laid off when times get tough within a company? It's often the pra practitioners that are sure. doing process improvement. So what's wrong with that picture? Are we training all these black belts and master black belts? But often it's just up to them to go get the projects done. Management's not asking for the project. So I think that there's something wrong with that picture. And what we really need to do is do something fundamentally different where we integrate process improvement efforts to the overall business uh, system, which includes scorecards and strategic planning. Now, when you say that the, the, the management is not looking for those projects to be done, you mean that the, the black belts are out there actually looking for projects but are not necessarily aligned to the strategy or strategic interest of the company? Well, that can be part of it. But even if they're assigned to a project, often after it gets started, it's just up to them to get it done. What I really think needs to get happen is that we have the scorecards that are really run, and I want to have them predictive, so that the manager of the process is asking for the projects to get done. And I just don't see that happening. You know, you, you mentioned predictive, and I think that's a great term because you used a, a phrase when we were chatting yesterday a little bit that, you know, you can't, you can't drive your car by looking in the rear view mirror. And a lot of these, uh, a lot of the charting, a lot of the analysis that people do are really trailing indicators. So, you know, you brought, what you're really working on is the idea of trying to come up with leading indicators, the indicators that can tell you what's going to happen if you continue to do things the way that you're doing them. And that's what I found really interesting about your, your plan, your program. Yes, and um, one of the slides I'm going to present is showing why the red, yellow, green scorecards can lead to a lot of firefighting. Mm -hmm. You know, when it's red, oh my gosh, let's get out there and beat up on somebody, get sure. somebody we on. Oh, green, it's going in and uh, bring out the champagne. <laughs> but in my presentation, I show one that's a true scorecard, a red, yellow, green scorecard, when it's toggling between red, yellow, and green, mm -hmm. but in reality, it's all common cause variability. Now, the beauty of this predictive scorecard system is you're using history, but you're going back in time using what I call 30,000 foot level metrics. And now, if you've got a recent region of stability, you can consider that data from that point, uh, uh, that recent region, to be a, a, a random sample of the future. And now we can go in and, and look at that using probability plots or whatever to go in and create an estimate. And if we don't like what we see, then we got to do something different. The analogy on the car, we're looking out the windshield, and if we don't like what we see, we got to turn the steering wheel, apply the brakes, which is not unlike a process improvement project. And what you really want to do is have the owner of the processes asking for that project to get done because they understand that it's going to help the big picture. I think when people think of the application of statistical process control, they tend to think of, uh, for example, manufacturing process, although certainly it's applicable to service, project, uh, service uh, 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 delivery and so on. But as I understand what you're doing, you're taking and really applying it to management processes and strategic processes. Can you talk about that a bit? Yes, uh, typically what we have in SPC, control charting, is to do what it says, control the process. So the idea is what we're looking for special cause situations, mm -hmm. and what we want to do is stop the presses if we get a special cause situation and fix a problem. Mm -hmm. That's not what this is. This is what I call 30,000 foot level, like an airplane. You're not getting involved in the details of it. If there's difference between machines, operators, or even days of the week, we consider that to be a source of common cause variability, mm -hmm. and we don't want to react to all that. And so we're looking at using an individual's chart as opposed to an expert chart, R chart, and P chart, mm -hmm. to really go in and give us a handle on what that should be. And so it's a really different way of using control charts to assess stability of the process. But the people that would use that predictive process would be typically executives and senior managers. How do you get them to really understand the value of statistical analysis as applied to man uh, management processes as opposed to them trusting their statisticians on staff and their manufacturing engineers to really take care of those sort of processes? Well, that's one of the real challenges you have. I don't expect the CEO to be able to create these charts, but I, I wanted them to be able to read these charts. Now, one of the challenges you have is whenever I presented just recently at the CFO conference, there was a lot of presentations 
presentations. And what they were trying to do is create data so that now we manage to those data. That's managed into the Ys. But really what you want to do is manage into the Xs. So you know what it's called when you manage into the Ys? It's called management by hope. You know, And you don't want to do that. You really want to go in and look at the Y values because that's what you're going to get. And if you don't like what you see, you've got to change the X's and the process itself. Now, that's a very different way of managing the business. We tend to go in and set goals and variances to goals. But in reality, we can go in and start playing games and, uh, with the numbers and lead to a lot of unhealthy behaviors. And part of the problems I think we've got in our financial crisis is is behaviors because of what we're doing is uh, variances to goals. And so what I'm suggesting, we just need to do something fundamentally different in our overall business system. And, and how, where do you draw your data from? How widely dispersed or what's the breadth of the different kinds of data that you collect? that would be drawn into this whole analysis? Well, I think it's really important to start with what I call the enterprise value chain. Mm -hmm. This is describing fundamentally what you do. You develop product, you market product, sell product, produce, deliver, invoice, and collect, and then report to financials. Very high level metrics. And then what you want to do each of those functions, you want to figure out what's a reasonable metrics from quality, cost, and time. Notice how these metrics are not going to change over time, no matter who the leadership is. You're also going to have support groups. You're going to have things like a, uh, IT and HR and and those are going to have those metrics too relative to quality, cost, and time. Legal services as well. Yeah, uh, the legal relations, services, sure. labor relationships, all, all those. Yep. Those functions because that's really important to look at them all. And now you're getting a big picture assessment. Notice now the organization chart is subordinate to the value chain. Yeah. So if you reorganize you're going to be fundamentally doing the same thing. And that's what I want to look at those quality, cost, and time metrics in a predictive manner so that now we can see if what we're looking at out the windshield, and if we don't like what we see, then we're going to have to do something fundamentally different. See, I like the integrated nature of that because you talk about that and talk about tying together all of these very important metrics, and many times we don't. We have a very narrow view of what improvement means, and you can improve you know, one little tiny piece of the puzzle you know, you can use the analogy to say, well, you know, gosh, you can, you can fix the window pane on the third floor, but it doesn't matter if you've got to knock down the whole house, right? I mean, you know, being too concerned about the small picture really can many times get you in serious trouble because what you're talking about is looking at the entire enterprise in an integrated approach and making sure that the entire enterprise is going in the right direction and is, is profitable. Profit is always the number one bottom line here, obviously. Yeah, and I'll give you an example that builds upon what you just said. I was a keynote at a, a defense contractor, and the general manager is saying we're doing lean, 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 lean. Ooh. I said, well, that's great. So I looked at the facility. And boy, they were doing a great job in leading. I told them so. I said, but I know you got an awful lot of idle equipment. What are you doing to improve your sales and marketing process? Yeah. As in blank stare. Yeah. Well, that's your obviously bottleneck. Yeah, right. And, and so now you can do a great job in lean or whatever for process improvement, but you can go out of business doing it. Now, it seems to me, and I don't mean to sound too grandiose in this way, but uh, being a bit of a fan of Stephen Hawking, and uh, uh, I, it seems like you're talking a little bit as though you're trying to create a sort of unified field theory for running a business. You know, in terms of the, the totality, the yeah, holistic yeah. view of the entire process, not just concentrating on, you know, the finance component or the uh, strategic planning component or the manufacturing component, but the entire enchilada. Yeah, it's exactly what I'm trying to do here because uh, I just, at the CFO conference, Davenport, Thomas Davenport, who's written a book on analytics at work, you know, and he's written uh, pretty popular books on this sort of topic. But the question is, where do you go in and focus your efforts? I'm, I'm all for analytics, but you need to have an orchestrated system for pulling it all together. And otherwise, you can go in and lead to siloed projects and siloed effort. Or even talks about, in his book, talks about, uh, an orchestrated system where you can get analytical fiefdoms and that's not good either. Yeah. So you want to put it all together and I think that's very important and I think that's what often happens um, with our current business system. That's, that's just something that's lacking. Yeah, we, I mean these are all sins that, are, that have been apparent and have been apparent for, for quite a while. Are, are you seeing these, these problems more in American organizations versus Asian, Japanese organizations? It would, it would seem to me that, that, that the DNA of many American companies, many, many American managers is more of a firefighting, intuitive, gut level approach, and I don't want to cast any aspersions on anyone out there in our audience, but it, it seemed to me that that, 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 
that, that paradigm holds true a little bit of, of Japanese company versus an American company. Would you comment on that? Do you think that's true? Well, I think in, um, I think certain cultures, we want to have a leader that's going to take charge. Mm -hmm. If a company really gets in problems in the United States, we go in and what do we do? Try to hire a new CEO to right. fix the problem. They're going to bring their cronies in, and now does that really go in and fix the problem? More often than not, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. What I'm suggesting, you really need to have a business system that pulls it all together, and um, that can be difficult in certain cultures, mm -hmm. so, uh, not only the United States, but other parts of the world as well. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I think it's interesting. I mean, you know, these these are discussions that we have all the time, and and amongst ourselves and our readers too. That that comment about, well, you know, are there differences in cultures? And if there are differences in cultures, well, what can you do about it? A culture is a culture, right? I mean, but you know, all of us have to be advocates, right? And that's another thing that you mentioned is is you know, people have to be advocates for this in their own organization, and and they have to try to carry that message upward because many times I think it becomes a, a not literally, but but in some way a, a finger pointing. That the management says, well, that's the quality guy's job to do that. And the quality people say, well, that's management that has to do that. They have to lead us there. But I mean, everybody's got to take the, ro the role and the responsibility of, of taking ownership for it and saying, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure that the right people in my organization know what the problems are, what I see, and, and maybe some suggestions about how to, how to handle them as well. And, and let me just add, uh, you know, kind of a, a, a side question to that is, when you're talking with organizations about this, particularly at the executive level, What's their reaction as to who should, um, not necessarily spearhead this, but who should carry the burden of the day-to-day -day work in actually implementing uh, this integrated uh, uh, enterprise excellence? Well, I think that's one of the challenges we might have. We don't really have anyone um, taking this on. Could it be a quality manager? It sure could be. And I, I, that's the reason we presented the CFO conference, because maybe they're the right ones, too. It sure. could be in their department, sure. too. But I think it depends upon really the individual. Are they really willing to go in and step up to the plate and take it on? And if you've got a quality manager or quality director that's really willing to take it on, I think that's a, a fairly good place to start. Mm -hmm. But I've created or suggested in the value chain an enterprise process management department. Okay, so that's the one that's responsible for pulling it all together, mm -hmm. and of which part of it is doing projects, part of it's quality, but you're also looking at on-time delivery and basically orchestrating the whole mm -hmm. thing together. Now, what's the best group to stand, take, uh, go up to the plate to do that? Well, I think it can depend upon the organization, and also depends upon the individuals. Are they mm -hmm. willing to do that and take that on as a challenge? Maybe it's akin to when uh, the whole TQM movement started that they were a lot of organizations did not uh, put that movement resident in the quality department. It was often separate from that, but yet many of the prospective managers who then populated those positions came from quality. It, as you said, they stepped up to that position because they showed that interest. Not necessarily a foregone conclusion that, well, we're going to just hire quality people into those mm -hmm. roles, but uh, it was those individuals who were willing to take the risk. And I wonder if, because it doesn't have the name quality in it, you know, TQM, of course, had the, the fortunate uh, advantage of having the word quality in its name, so obviously the quality department, QA guy, and so on, natural sort of uh, career progression, but would a typical and ambitious quality manager today see himself or herself move career-wise in that direction to something with an entirely different title like Integrated Enterprise Excellence. Yeah, yeah I think that that's uh, uh, very viable. I mean, one of the things about quality, we're having the tools. We got the tool set. What I'm suggesting is we take the same tool set we often apply in projects, but we use that part of the decision making, whether we ought to close this plan or hire more people or whatever. And and also how we're actually going to uh, create strategies. Yeah. You know, because a lot of times we're not creating strategies using this, the tools that uh, we often talk about. You know, fishbone diagrams sure. and cause and effect matrix and those sorts of tools can be really valuable. And also even some of the analytics that we have along the way, analysis of variance, analysis of means, regressions, and so on, those sorts of tools can yeah. also be applied at the business level. But I don't see that happen as much as I think it should. Boy, it always, it, you know, it, it, it's funny how often it comes down to this, this, this thing we talk about all the time, the future of quality. What is the future of quality? What is the future of this profession? What is the future of, of, the, of the word itself? What is, you know, how, where's that going to, we don't know. I, I bet every single yeah. viewer out there I right think so. now wants an answer to that question. Yep. Yep. 
I think I think you're right. I think that's and, and it's an excellent question. I, and you know what? I don't have the answer. I mean, but it's a discussion that <laughs> that we want to continue to have, and, and certainly we encourage uh, the folks out there to to write us uh, at qdlqualitydigest.com and um, you know or just comment on on the bottom of of, of this uh, player page. You know, we have a comment button, and you can. Let us know what you think. If you want to speak to Forrest, we'll, we'll make sure we forward your, your comments over to Forrest and get the discussion going. Because I think that's really part of what we're trying to do here uh, in, in, with our, our Quality Digest daily newsletter, as well as, as QDL, this, this, this TV show, that we're trying to you know, foster the discussion and, and move it forward. So. And I'd love to take this discussion further with you yep. as well. I know, I, I have no doubt it's something our viewers and our readers yep. want to hear more about Absolutely. in terms of the evolution of their own and how it might affect their careers. Yep. Yep. Forrest, thank you for joining us. Good, good uh, program today with, with Forrest, and uh, I think it's, uh, we're, we're certainly looking forward to, to talking to you more, and, and again, continuing the discussion with our, uh, with our readers and our viewers as well. So thanks, thanks, for, thanks for joining us on the show. Thank you. For Thank you. Good to see you. Well, um, we're, before we close, I want to mention that we, uh, we have a, a special Tech Corner program uh, on, on this episode of Quality Digest Live. And as you know, Tech Corner is uh, our, our, our little program where we, we present uh, today's uh, newest and, and best technologies, things that are out in the market that we think are really cool. And of course, hey, this is the place to come for that. So we were at the Farrah booth earlier today and we, we shot at Tech Corner with Orlando Perez, who is product manager with Farrow, with their Edge arm and a very cool motorcycle that they're using. Uh, Paul Jr. is, right. is, the, uh, is the, the manufacturer of the bike and he uses the Farrow Edge arm and it's uh, very interesting. And Orlando's gonna tell you about the Edge arm and he's gonna tell you about the bike. Uh, so take a look at this tech corner and we'll be back in a minute. So this is Farrow's uh, brand new uh, Farrow arm, the Farrow Edge. It's a brand new uh, portable measurement uh, articulated CMM. It was built from the ground up, brand new, brand new uh, electronics, uh, everything to make it the most uh, advanced CMM, portable articulator CMM in the market today. Uh, one of the key brand new features of our new Ferro Edge arm is the uh, built-in touchscreen computer. Uh, we've added basic functionality that many people use. Uh, they want to uh, quickly measure a, a diameter, a dimension, a distance of a part. And for them not to have to go back to the computer and use that and have to like you know, load up the computer, wait for that, take a measurement. We've added a lot of that functionality right on the arm itself so that people can simply go ahead and touch the screen. Everyone's very familiar with, the, uh, with today's smart technology, smartphones and other things that use touch screens. So we've incorporated uh, a touch screen into our arm. Basically, we're kind of calling it our, the smart arm technology. So you can go in here and basically say, here's your measurement uh, features. You can you know, select that. We have you know, most, most basic features that people kind of have to do you know, day in and day out. Like they want to check the diameter of a part. So we have a circular feature in there. And it's as simple as just grabbing the arm and pointing down. We have a part here that we're going to do a quick check on. So just take a few points. It's a simple uh, two button operation, green and red button. We just take a few points on the plate. As you can see, we have really large and noticeable LEDs on the part that allow us to know exactly what button is being hit. When you're done, I hit the red button. That confirms or accepts my, uh, my measurement routine. Then I just go right inside and take some measurements into the diameter I want to check. I confirm with my red button and immediately I get results uh, in my touchscreen computer. So that totally allows me to be more productive, be quicker in my measurements without having to go into the computer. And many people would just kind of be replacing or could be replacing a lot of their uh, typical hand tools, calipers, micrometers just with this functionality. The brand new arm is, uh, is built you know, out of uh, composite materials as you can see. Very durable, very scratch resistant. Uh, we've actually reconfigured the way that the arm, uh, the encoders are located to basically move a lot of the weight away from the hand of the operator and back into the base. So basically it's a lot lighter on the operator uh, at this time. Our arm is a seven axis model, meaning that it has seven uh, locations where it rotates, making it very, very articulate and very easy to manipulate when you move it around. Um, it does have, uh, this is our brand new laser line probe that attaches to the uh, arm. It's, uh, it's probably the smallest laser line uh, in the industry today. It only adds about 2.8 ounces additional weight to the, to the arm itself. So you can basically leave it there all the time and not have to remove it and use it you know, anytime you want to scan or collect data. One of the new things that we've incorporated into our uh, software is the ability to capture a point cloud. Uh, we're definitely trying to make uh, point cloud measurement accessible to everyone. So I'm just gonna point at it. I have a range indicator that tells me how, how uh, 
far I am. Here's red. I'm in the far field of the, uh, of the scanner. I can zoom in here when I'm green. I'm right there in the sweet spot. We basically want to take this whole 3D technology mainstream by adding this new technology and make it accessible to everyone. We've also done a little bit of a difference here in how the arm just kind of sits up. It's very nice, very, very clean. Um, the, uh, the, the color scheme and the new look of the arm actually gave way to uh, the idea of getting a, uh, a custom bike or custom chopper built for Ferrell to celebrate our 30th anniversary, the introduction of the new Edge arm, and many other products that we are going to be introducing, you know, like the Camp to Measure software and other products that will be coming in the future. We actually uh, uh, got Paul Jr. from Paul Jr. Design from the uh, TV show American Chopper to build Ferro a bike. And the bike was actually built after the likeness of our brand new Ferro arm, using the styling cues of the arm, the, uh, the carbon fiber elements, and uh, they actually used the uh, arm in the fabrication of the of the bike to build uh, to basically capture shapes, profiles, and different elements of the bike, so they can use them and take them to water jet cutting and other features to make them really really custom made. Well, thanks Orlando and and thanks Faro for for letting us air that that interesting Tech Corner segment. And if any of you out there have uh, interesting products that you want to see in Tech Corner, uh, hardware, software, even some services, that would be something that we would definitely consider bringing on the show. So we encourage everybody to absolutely go ahead and, and send us your ideas for, for Tech Corner, please, or any story ideas you may have for QDD or QDL. We're always uh, always interested in, again, having that exchange with you and, and talking about, about what is active and current in our industry. Well, that's our show for today. Jeff, thank you for joining us on this program. We My pleasure. Look forward to having you on many times in the future. And of course, we thank Forrest for joining us too uh, in this, uh, this episode of, of Quality Digest Live. So thanks, everybody. We'll, uh, we'll catch you next week uh, here on, on QDL. Look for us next Friday, and have a great weekend. Thanks, everybody. Bye.